Hi everyone, Heather Roberts here from uh, STC Library, and I made a mistake and uh, did not start the recording um, prior to the introduction for uh, Donna Clark Love. So I am re-recording that so we can have it in front of the uh, recording of her lecture. So again, my name is Heather Bobrowitz. I'm the programming librarian here at uh, South Texas College Library. And on behalf of STC Library, I'd like to welcome tonight's guest speaker, Donna Clark Love. Donna is an internationally recognized bully expert, workshop trainer, keynote presenter, and motivational speaker. She's a certified trainer of uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, and a certified mediator and conflict resolution trainer. Donna has been featured on NBC's Today Show and Evening News to highlight successful prevention trainings. She's been featured in Forbes magazine, and recently she was asked to provide expert commentary for Good Morning America. Donna has trained for the uh, National Department of Education and on Indian reservations, American Air Force bases, and worked with a Maori tribe in New Zealand. Contracted by the Belizean government, she trained government employees and teachers on how to develop a culture of respect and combat workplace violence. In February of 2018, Donna trained and consulted with NASA's Johnson Space Center employees on addressing culture, peer conflicts, and digital bullying via social media. The success of Donna's groundbreaking, humorous, and dynamic workshops has gained her international recognition. Donna was asked to speak at the International Workplace Bullying and Harassment Conference in Bordeaux, France in June 2018. Bringing over 30 years of experience in the field as a former educate, educator, <laughs> a former educator, district administrator, interventionist, author and business consultant, Donna captivates, connects, emphasizes, engages, and inspires her audience to make lasting changes. A sought out motivational conference and convention keynote speaker and coach, Donna is also frequently asked to provide workshops for staff, parents, and students in public, private, and parochial schools, as well as for in universities and nonprofit organizations. Tonight, she'll be presenting for us on the topic of cultivating grit and why that is so important. So now I'm going to transfer the video magically over to Donna. Oh, and while there, uh, there was an Australian team and there was an Australian psychiatrist that taught us this opening activity. And I want you to do it with me. I'm gonna trust you're gonna do it with me even though I cannot see you. So if everybody will stand up, standing up, here's what you're gonna do. You are going to, uh, like what I'm doing, rub your hands together. What are we doing? We're generating a positive attitude and enthusiasm for what Donna's going to be talking about, which is grit. Now, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Now, I added a little bit of my American to this Australian thing, and we're going to do it like this. And Heather, thank you for doing it with me. We're going to go like this. I feel good. And we're going to close with Tiger Woods. Yes. So let me review what it looks like. You are generating a positive attitude and enthusiasm for the topic of grit. I'm going to count to three and you're going to go, I feel good. And you're going to close with yes. Everybody got that? Now, in Australia, they do this activity before major sporting events. The whole crowd does it. So here we go. Ready? We are generating a positive attitude and enthusiasm for the topic of grit. I'm going to count to three. We're going to go, I feel good. We're going to close with Tiger Woods. Yes. Ready? One, two, three. I feel good. Yes. All right, I think you're ready to go now. So since I want you to develop grit in your own life, one of the components and aspects of developing grit is for us to get out of our comfort zone, to do things that are scary. And let me give you an example of this. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt knew about grit way back. 
And she had a saying, and she would tell people, do one scary thing a day if you want to grow and change in your life. And a lot of what Angela Duckworth, who has done the most research on grit, talks about this aspect of us being willing to step out of our comfort zone, of us being willing to do something different. And that is what I'm here with you today. And everything I do, I'm going to do some interactive activities, even with Zoom. Um, I want you to jump in. And I'll, let me give an example. Um, maybe you're one that you don't like to post in the chat room. You like everybody else to post. You feel uncomfortable doing that. I suggest that you do that today that you step up and do things differently, that you try out new things that I'm gonna ask you to do. And I love when Peter Drucker, who is one of the most sought out speakers for Fortune 500 companies, and he's written 39 books, amazing on success. He finishes nearly every presentation he does with, I, I challenge each of you to leave here and do one scary thing a day. Take on one task that is a little out of your comfort zone. And this is about developing grit in our own life. Okay, here's your first assignment. Well, I'm gonna, I can't see you, but I think you can see each other. Is that right, Heather? Can they see each other or not? I, nope. okay. Not unless they're in the same room together, um, yeah, okay. alas. <laughs> okay. So they can do it in the chat room. I want you now in the chat room is to write down one characteristic or synonym of grit or how you would define grit. Do not Google this. I want you to just in your head think of when you hear the word grit, what do you think of? Everybody crash the chat. Um, and tell me what you think of. Carlos said gutsy, keep going, come on. Determination, Dr. Bean, keep going. Outgoing, Samantha, bravery, courage, confidence, risk taker, Maria, Sandra, inner shrink. Keep going, keep going. Persistence, yes, keep going. What do you think of when you think of grit? Superwoman power, says Sandra, good. Keep going. Chris, tenacity, ambition, Priscilla. Uh, Y'all are going fast now. Carlos, Fortitude, Linda, mental toughness. Yes, wicked humor. I love it. Mental toughness, Fortitude. Keep going. Fierce, bravery, tough, and strength. Pearls, oysters. Keep going. Keep going. Strength, confidence. Keep going. Anything that comes to your mind when you optimistic when you think of great spirit. Yes, these are great. Outgoing, having courage, being fearless. Hard-headedness, <laughs> stick to itness. I love that. I love that. Great. Okay, so I'm going to start my PowerPoint, and I um, I do some with PowerPoint when I do presentations live. I usually don't even use it. I like to do a lot of experiential, but for this tonight, I, I am going to use a PowerPoint and hang in here with me uh, with this. Okay, so this is Angela Duckworth, as I will mention her more than once. She's written the book on grit. She has done the most research on grit, what it is, and she defines it as perseverance and sustained passion for long-term goals. So what it is, it's about extreme effort over a long period of time that it is a little different from persistence and that it you add this piece of the perseverance and passion you put those together and that is how the you know what in the education world they're defining grit and I, over here some of you said this this are some synonyms and i'm calling the first cousins of grit and some of you 
came up with these and you know and I love this uh the backbone and the spirit some of you had these so remember that definition by Angela Duckworth grit is a deliberate effort combined with passion you gotta have that passion piece and I will get into that more Grit starts with believing that amazing things can happen when you don't give up, no matter what. Grit asks us to go the distance, stop at nothing, and to move through obstacles. The reason I chose this picture is because when I was, I guess, maybe 25, I went on this outward bound thing with my church because I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. Oh my gosh. And it was for three weeks. I thought I was going to die. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And we had to um, climb a rock and then repel a rock. And I got halfway up the rock and I, I thought, I mean, my knuckles were bleeding. I started crying and we had to get to the top to repel the other side to join the group. And there were three of us left. And I just said, I can't do this. I stopped and uh, I could hear the cheering, you know, Donnie, you got this, you can do this. Just take it one step at a time just move an inch that's all you have to do we're here for you there there's no time limit you can do this and with their encouragement i was able to make it to the top and part of developing grit in our own life is surrounding ourselves with what i call the grit builders these are people that tell us i know you can do this you've set this goal i believe in you you have the stamina and the courage and the will to do this. And that's what I needed. I needed those grit builders that were at the bottom cheering me on, or I probably would not have made it up that rock. And we have a choice. And I love this quote. You can throw in the towel or you can use it to wipe the sweat off your face. And, you know, just the recent example of Joseph Chen. I mean, he's amazing with what he's done. And I was reading about him today and I, I, Nathan Chen, and I was thinking about him. And, you know, in 2018, if you saw his, when he was skating, he had two major errors. He did not qualify. Um, he just couldn't get it together. And after that Olympics, he could have thrown in the towel. He could have said, I'm done. Uh, because, you know, people really said, I don't think he has it. I don't think he can do it. You know, he is not a, an Olympian. He doesn't have the power or the courage or the talent to move forward. But he didn't let this defeat stop him. And, you know, we've seen how he has won Olympic gold. And in his story, he talks about his mother, a uh, single mom who would drive him from uh, Saint, uh, from um, Utah to California twice a month in the car for him to compete because he didn't have the money to fly. And it started back when he was 12 years old. And so he is one that did not throw in the towel and he ended up winning the gold. Now, when you read about him, you, the coaches and his, and his teammates say that he has a passion for skating, that he loves it so much that even if he didn't win, that's gravy to win, of course, but he is doing what he loves doing. And I think when we look at grit, we have to look at what are we doing and does it, we, does it have meaning in our life and purpose? Would we do it if we never received any accolades. There's no obstacle that true grit and amazing grace cannot overcome. And, you know, I grew up with being told, Don, change your attitude. You need to have an attitude gratitude. Come on. And I, I changed this to adjusting the altitude because I love mountains. And having an altitude of optimism 
and enthusiasm creates new opportunities. And then the second piece of that about adjusting your altitude is seeking out those who share your positive and I can do this altitude. It is a scientific fact that your brain automatically imitates the behaviors of the people around you. It's called a mirror neuron. And I have people that tell me, you know, Donna, I hang around a lot of negative people, but it really doesn't affect me. And, I, you know, I challenge that. And, and I think that it does affect us. And I love Dr. Seuss quote here. It says, you'll move mountains. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. And why is it so important? I'm gonna share some research here if you wanna take notes. And with Angela Duckworth, uh, most of her, and she's from uh, University of Pennsylvania, most of her work is, um, she's done a tremendous amount of research. Um, that grit is the main driver of achievement and success. Being naturally smart and talented, you know, these are great. But to truly do well, one needs the ability to keep on keeping on. Without grit, talent may be nothing more than unmet potential. So I want to stop here because I, I've taught uh, the realm. I've gifted and talented students, and I've also taught uh, students that were academically challenged. And you know, what I truly believe and what I've seen is that you can be brilliant and you can be talented. That does not mean you're going to be successful. That the driver is that grit, that determination and passion to achieve your goals, to keep going no matter what obstacles that you have to face. And you know people who are extremely talented and brilliant, and yet you just see all of this unmet potential. I saw an interview with uh, Will Smith. Oh my gosh, he was talking about grit. And you know, the reporter said, why are you so successful? And he goes, well, um, you know what I do? I am one that I don't give up. I set a goal and I do everything I can until I finish that goal. He said, I'm not the smartest chap around. I'm not the most talented singer or actor. But what I do is I study my craft. I hone on it. I develop my strengths. I work on my weaknesses. He said, I have courage. And I step out of my comfort zone. That's why I'm successful. You know, and I just, I loved to hear that. So predictors of success, here is some research. And um, Duckworth and Siegelman are, you know, Siegelman also was from, not University of Pennsylvania, but Stanford. And they have, with all their studies, demonstrated that grit is a better predictor of success in college than the SAT or IQ test. In fact, if you want to really look at this, in the last 15 years, Dr. Matthews from the Military Academy and Angela Duckworth have researched and surveyed and studied West Point graduates. And they have followed students when they first got into the academy, going through beginning training and all the way through. And they have found out that the ones that actually graduate at the end. The predictor is, did they have grit? It is not about how smart they are, who their families are, who went, who the relatives that went to West Point before them. It's not about SAT scores. It's about the ones that walk through the hard stuff and they stay in there till the end. Grit is the predictor of who is going to graduate and who is not. And some of these others, 1892, uh, Francis Galton, 
was researching the biographies of famous people. And he came up with this. He said, successful achievers are the ones that possess zeal and the tenaciousness to do hard labor. Uh, hard labor. Individuals high in grit were able to maintain their determination and motivation over long periods of experiencing even failure and adversity. Grit is a better predictor of success than intellectual talent. Here a lot is where I pulled my research from, from these authors, from these institutions. So before I go on, I'm gonna stop share for a minute because I need to check in with y'all. All right, here we go. Tell me what one thing that you have heard so far that resonates with you about grit? What have you heard so far that resonates with you about grit? You go, uh huh, I believe that. Yes. Tell me the moving mountains, the persistence. Yes. Keep going. Keep going. You have to have perseverance and passion, determination. Yes. Keep going. Studying your craft, yes. Hard work, going through the challenges, yes. Yes, stepping out of your comfort zone. If you hear nothing else from me today, my challenge to you is every day do one thing that's scary. Very good, never give up, that's right. Keep going, if you've not chatted yet, put it in there. Don't give up when it gets hard. Believing it's already waiting for you. I love this. Being, you can hear my cat, being able to face failure. Don't throw in the towel when it gets tough. Pushing through the struggles, having courage. Uh, the kitty has grit. That's good. <laughs> having motivation. Yes. Great. Never give up. Be successful. Yes. We all have that. I have a question for you. Can grit be learned or is it hereditary? Here's my question to you. Can grit be learned or is it just what you inherit? Yes, learned, learned. Yes, yes, it can be learned. Now, environmental factors can influence you and help you with this. If you grew up in a family that was highly motivated and accomplished their goals and supported you and, and giving your goals, it's going to be easier for you to demonstrate grit. But every single person can learn grit. And it does not matter what your IQ is. It does not matter what you walk through in your life. It does not matter about your SAT scores. It does not matter how many times you failed. You can learn and develop grit in your own life. Okay, so let me go on. Am I talking too fast? I tend to go fast. No, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right, let me go on with this. Of course, it's gonna go back to where I was. All right. So here's what I want you to do. You can take out a piece of paper like I had for Spunk. I'm going to tell you some stories because one of the components in developing grit is admitting, acknowledging, sometimes apologizing, apologizing for our mistakes. It's owning our own mistakes and getting back up. And these are examples of mistakes made good and adversity. I'm going to go through these. These are my favorite six stories. I'm going to go through them. They're pretty short. And on your paper, I want you to write one or two of these stories that resonates with you, that you need to hear in your own life. Maybe you need to tell someone in your family or a friend. Maybe someone is really discouraged uh, in achieving their goals, and you would like to share with them this story. So everybody with me, you're going to write on that paper one or two, and then we're going to do something with that. Okay, here's the first one, spilled milk. This is one of my favorites. 
A renowned scientist was, and he didn't give his name, he was interviewed by a New York reporter. And this is a scientist that has had more, in, uh, more inventions that have um, changed actually our medical um, field uh, through his inventions that he has in these, you know, everything from certain different types of lab instruments, all of his inventions have historically changed our medical arena and helped us to progress forward in our medical discoveries. And so he was interviewed and he said, sir, will you tell me why you're so successful? Because look at all of these different inventions that had your name on it. And he said, I want to tell you a story. And it's about when I was five years old and it's about my mom. And I, and this is in the, at the end of the 1800s. And he said, I went to the refrigerator. Back then they had the bottled milk and I was sneaking in the kitchen and I wanted to get a glass of milk and I grabbed the bottle of milk and it fell, it broke and milk went everywhere. Now, my mom came into the kitchen and I started crying because I thought I would get in trouble. And she said, oh, son, she said, it's not a problem. You know, we're going to make this a game. I want you to figure out how you can clean this up best. You figure it out. So first, what he did is he got a broom. Well, you know, when you sweet milk, it goes everywhere and glass. And she said, well, you've learned that that didn't work so well. So try something else. Then he tried a paper towel and that didn't work very well. And then he got a rag and he started wiping it up but he was having problems with the glass. Oh God, listen to my cat. He's having problems with the glass. And then he got the broom and he was able to sweep up the glass and then use this large towel to mop up the milk. And she said, son, you've learned something today, how to clean up a mess. But well, let's take it one step further. She said, I'm going to fill up these empty bottles that we have, milk bottles with water. We're going to go outside. I'm going to set them on the shelf in our backyard, and I want you to practice grabbing them and figure out how, when you grab them, you can hold tightly to the bottle so that it doesn't fall and break or that you don't spill any water. And he's like, oh, goody. So he went outside, and his mom lined these up, his first glass or his first bottle he reached up and he did the same like some of us do the same thing over again picked it up from the top and it crashed too heavy for him to hold his mother said that's okay we're going to clean it up later now you've tried this twice and it hasn't worked what are you going to do next and he thought about it and what he did this time is he reached in to the second bottle and he grabbed the bottom we wrapped his hands around the bottle of the milk bottle and he slowly brought it out and it didn't fall and it didn't break and then she said I want you to walk with this bottle and you can't spill any water so he started walking but he walked too fast and the water went everywhere so she said let's do it again he grabbed from the bottom on the third bottle brought it down to himself, carried it around his chest area, and he walked very slowly. She said, look, now next time that you grab that milk bottle, you're going to do it correctly. Now, is this not great parenting? Oh, my gosh. And he said to this reporter, I learned that I can make mistakes and learn from them, that it was okay to make mistakes. In fact, I have made thousands of mistakes over the years and I have learned to go back and figure out what was wrong with this lab experiment. My mom gave me permission to do that. I love it, I love his mom, I thought that was great. Okay, here's the second one, invention of potato chips. In 1853, George Crumb owned a restaurant in New York and uh, there was a woman that was eating one day and he served like meat and potatoes and she took a bite of the potatoes and she said, Ugh, 
these are soggy. I don't like them. And she sent them back to the chef. And George Crumb was owner of the restaurant, creator of the restaurant and the chef. And they said, she doesn't like them, it's too soggy. So he cooked them this time a little more well done. He sent them out to her. And she said they were too big too, that it was hard for her to cut uh, into bites that she could eat. So he cut them smaller. He cut the potatoes smaller and he sent it out. And then she said, it is still the chunks of the potato are too big and too soggy. Well, he was furious with her. So what he did is he sliced that potato as thin as he could. He said, I'll show her. I'm going to fry these. I'm going to make them so crispy. She won't even mention the word soggy. Well, he sent them out and they look like large potato chips. And she thought that they were the best thing in the whole world and passed them around to the restaurant. And so he got a patent on this and he became the inventor of potato chips just from a mistake. Here's the next one. This is about 11 year old. I tell this to younger kids. Frank Epperson was 11 years old. And he went outside was in Minnesota, it was very cold. And back then he, they made soda from mixing powder with a stir and water, like their soda water, which would be equivalent our soda pop. He went outside with his soda water and he mixed it and his mom called him into dinner. So he left that glass of soda water with the stick in it, the stir. And he forgot about it. And the next day he went out after school and he noticed that it was frozen. He's like, whoa. And he just picked up the glass and he kind of worked with the stick and he pulled it out. And there was kind of a lopsided, lopsided, frozen, what we would call a popsicle. And he's like, wow, he started licking it. He thought, this is so good. And he took it in to, for his mom to see and to taste. And she thought it was good. Then he took it in his neighborhood and let all of his little buddies lick this and taste it. And later on, his dad got a patent and they called it the Eppersickle. And he loved his dad so much that he changed the patent to Popsicle. So, and this was also made by mistake. All right, here we go to adversity. So I want you to remember your thinking of what story resonates with me? What do I need to learn from this? And how can I apply it to my own life? Gold Rush in Colorado, three feet, true story. There was a man who decided that he, there was still gold in Colorado. And he lived across the country and he decided to sell his business. Um, he was an engineer. And he moved to Colorado and he hired a team and he bought a crane and their equipment and he bought this huge parcel of land and he said, I think there is still gold in this land. So I'm going to go drilling for gold and I'm going to give myself a year to do this. Well, after six months, he was so tired and so exhausted and broke. <laughs> and he said, I just don't think there's gold here. You know, I'm going to give it up. I, I'm ready to move back home. I, this is not going to work for me. So the next day, he put his equipment up for sale and he sold the rest of the land that he had not drilled on and he sold it to another engineer. And this engineer, this is a true story, the next week, started from where he left off of the land and started drilling and within three feet discovered gold. You know, and, and I love this story because it reminds me, don't give up before the miracle happens. Um, and he gave up on his dream. He gave up on his passion. He gave up pretty quickly and he didn't finish that goal. Here's the next one. Some of you have heard this story. And this is a man, and he was over 65, living on Social Security. And he lived in a small house, and he had a beat-up car. And he decided, he was alone, and he decided that he needed to have purpose in his life. And the only thing he could do was make good chicken, he thought. So he said, you know what? I'm going to sell my little bungalow and I'm going to get a new car or a newer car. 
I'm going to drive around the United States and see if I can find a restaurant that might be willing to buy my recipe because everybody that tastes it loves it. Everyone from my church and my neighbors and my friends. So I'm just going to do that. So he got in his little Rambler car that he purchased and he went everywhere. And sometimes restaurants would laugh at him. I said, we don't want your recipe. And sometimes they would cook it and go, yeah, it's good, but we're not going to buy it. He even tried to give it away to some restaurants. And on the 1010th restaurant, he walked in, the owner was there and the chef. And they said, we'll cook this chicken. They cooked up a batch of the chicken and the owner tasted it and said, this is the best chicken I've ever had in my life. We'll buy your recipe, sir. Who is this? This is uh, Colonel Chicken, I mean, <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and he, the Colonel, Colonel Sanders and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Here is my next story, the butterflies cocoon. And this makes me think of children. And there was a little girl who, she had read a book, a little, a, a small book about the butterfly and she found a cocoon in her mom's garden. And she was so excited about it. And she so much wanted to see that butterfly hatch out of the cocoon. And every day she would watch it. And some days the cocoon would kind of move back and forth. And she's like, oh, it's going to be out soon. And one day she noticed that it was moving back and forth. And the next morning she kept coming outside to see it. And all day that cocoon did not move at all. It was totally still. And she said, something's wrong. I need to help this butterfly hatch out of the cocoon. She went and got a pair of scissors, came back and cut the cocoon open. And when the cocoon was open, there was the butterfly. But the butterfly could not fly because his wings had not been totally developed. The little girl did not know that that butterfly had to stay in that cocoon and wrestle against the cocoon to get liquid into its wings to develop. And sometimes the cocoon needed to be totally still, but there was a process and that butterfly could not come out of that cocoon until its wings were fully developed. And I think when we talk about walking through adversity, when we talk about grit, is sometimes we cut the wings of kids and those around us because we see that their journey is very hard and we feel sorry for them and we think it's too difficult. And the truth is they need to walk through the pain to get to the other side. We don't have to jump in and rescue and cut their wings. We want them to fully develop. Okay, so now I'm going to stop the sharing. And now I want to hear from you. What story resonated with you that you would like to share with others that you would, that, you know, you think about in my own life? I need to hear this story for myself. Go. What story? The spill milk. Thank you. The gold rush. Yes. Lesson of the butterfly. Yes. Perfect. Keep going. The spill milk. Potato chips. Yes. The butterfly. The gold rush. The butterfly. The spilled milk. The butterfly. Keep going. You're doing great. If you've not if you've not chatted before, go for it. Go for it. The gold rush. Yes. The butterfly. KFC, yes, the butterfly, the gold rush, keep going, the spill milk, keep going. Yes, keep going. If you've not, if you've not chatted yet, I want to give you a chance to chat. Which story resonates with you? Mm, good. The gold rush, Anna Flores. Thank you. Good. Keep going. The gold rush. Yes. Sandra KFC Romero spilled milk. Keep going. Think of what story you want to remember and resonates with you okay so let me keep okay kentucky fried chicken never give up yeah chris thank you yes good very good okay 
So let me go to this. I'm going to, I'm going to just share a few more things with you about this. I, uh, I'm going to show you how many of you, I mean, I guess you can't raise your hands, but um, I have studied uh, this group, BTS. Oh, and yes, they have problems and issues, but this group has demonstrated grit more than any group I have ever read about um, that's become so famous, uh, the BTS. And I want to tell you how they have demonstrated grit, because I think this is an important story that we can be telling others, especially kids that really are into this group. Some of you adults uh, may really love them too. I love their music. But I want to tell you some things of why, how they have demonstrated grit. First of all, out of all of them, these are the original seven, there were only two that had any type of music lessons or dancing lessons. The rest of them learned by dancing on a corner, by watching others. Um, and there was no money in their homes to learn a skill uh, by a professional. So they learned some instruments and dancing and singing on their own. Another thing about them is that four out of the seven came from uh, what we call immense poverty and in Korea and that some of them came from very poor farmers. And in that, you know, they talk about that the number one thing in Korea in order to be um, to have accolades, to, to be respected when you're a kid is that it's about education. You, you know, you study all day, you come home, you study at night, you get up in the morning, you study, you go to a higher level school. It's all about education. That is kind of like, the, that is the most respected thing you are supposed to do. And these kids did not do that. And uh, two of them were ostracized from their families. They had a passion and love for music. And here is something that I find, let me get this, so cool, is that when they were just, they had this, they sat down and we talk about, you know, we talk about setting goals for our life. And they sat down when they were very young and their ages at that time were 12 to 17. And they said, let's make a pact between us, among us. And let's follow this pact. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're not gonna give up our dream until we get one paying gig in our community. We're gonna, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that we get a paying gig. Now, these kids worked hard. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment. Sometimes they would share a banana. They shared subway tokens. They were very, very poor. Uh, but that was the first thing on their pack. And here's the second thing they said. We will write 90% of our lyrics, and we're going to write about what's meaningful to us. Here's the next thing. When times are hard, we're not going to give up. We're gonna be loyal to each other and we're gonna have a strong work ethic. We are going to set each week how many hours we are gonna work at this because we wanna form a boy band, a hip hop boy band. We're gonna do it. This is incredible to me that they sat at young ages, they had this pack and it's all about grit. And one of these, it says being loyal to each other. When they've been interviewed by famous reporters, one of them, which is Bing Ling, is one that has struggled with alcoholism. And he's been to treatment and back. He gets sober, he goes back out, he gets sober, but he keeps trying. And they were interviewed and the reporter said, how could your band consider yourselves a success? I mean, you have somebody on your team that's a drug addict. I mean, really? How are you good examples for kids? And here's what they said. We are proud of him. You know why? He's admitted that he's an alcoholic and drug addict. 
Number two, he's gone to treatment. He asked for help. And we support him as he continues to try and as he continues to get help. We admire this. Oh my gosh, I love this. That's about in their pack. In this or about writing 90% of our lyrics. Did you know when they first started getting more well-known, they gave up recording contracts because the company said, we're not gonna allow you to write 90% of your lyrics. We want you to let us write at least 50%. And they turned down major contracts because of this. They had a passion and they had perseverance and they had long-term goals. That's about demonstrating grit. Uh, let me show you, let me do this. Is everybody staying with? Oh, they are handsome. Some of those are so handsome. Everybody staying with me. I wanna show you them on, and let's see if it even came up. Show on windows. Yeah, here we go. Let me just show you their thing on James Corden. Take this off, stop share. Um, yeah, the na 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 na. <laughs> and, and I like to show that because, you know, I think that they're just a great demonstration of uh, a group that came together and had a dream. And they, you know, they persevered. Okay, so let me go on. And some of you are Harry Potter fans. And uh, I don't know if you know that, um, that, you know, she was rejected by 12 publishers. Walt Disney was fired from his first newspaper job because he was told that he wasn't very creative in his writing. Um, I find that amazing. Michael Jordan, I, you know, if you want to see his documentary, it's all about grit. He talks about, you know, I missed more than 9,000 shots and I've lost 300 games. So, you know, this is all about people that we admire that stayed in there to pursue their dream. Okay, so let's go to this. How do you develop grit? Now, some of you may say, well, Donna, you know, I, um, I, I do develop, I mean, I do have grit and, and I, I have grit. All of us have a form of grit, but we can all enhance our grit. And I want to give you what the researchers, I came up with this six list from sometimes you'll see like you'll Google and it'll be 25 ways to develop grit in your life. I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. And uh, I think these are the best. These are the ones that I think are the ones that have been most researched. So number one, you believe that you can change, grow and achieve. I do a whole training on changing your mindset from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. Let me give you the example. A fixed mindset, you believe that people are born the way they are and they're never gonna change. That's just life. This is my personality. This is who I am. I'm not going to change, so deal with it. And the growth mindset says, I can learn how to do things differently. I can grow. An activity that I do that I love with uh, participants is when they come to the training, I, uh, when I do a day training, I tell them to start out. I said, you need to write down 10 things that have gone right with your morning already. And they kind of look at me on screen on Zoom and go, what? It is so much easier for us to focus on what has gone wrong. But starting our day with 10 things that have gone right so far is a great way to focus more on the growth mindset. Okay, that's number one. Number two, reframe how you view your mistakes. We've just been talking about that, learning from them, acknowledging them. Number three, uh, view frustrations and setbacks as part of the process. Now, 
You know, I have to tell you this, since I speak a lot to school districts, I hear from teachers a lot that say, my kids just give up when it gets hard or they get frustrated and they think they're dumb. That somewhere we have a generation of students that when it gets hard, they think they're doing something wrong. Frustration is a part of the process with developing grit. I'm telling you, if you want to develop grit, it is going to be hard. You're going to have tough days. And somewhere along the line, I don't know where we got this, that, that we're supposed to know how to do something and we're supposed to, from the first time we do it, know how to do it well. We have to see we trust in the process that it takes hard work. It's about hanging in there, even when we're frustrated. You know, and, and I talk to teachers about, um, you know, when kids with long-term goals that I think we've done students a disservice when we reward them at the end and go, you've, you know, you've received, you did your goal, yay. I think we need to be, and that's good and we should, but I think we need to be rewarding others on the journey and saying things like, you know what, you didn't get it right, but you keep trying and I'm proud of you. We need to reward the hard work, the days that are tough. And we say, you've been working on this for five weeks and I know that you haven't come up with an answer, but I want you to know that I see you, that I admire you, and I think you're going to get there. I want you to know that you're doing a great job. We got to reward in the process. The next thing, number four, engage in pursuits and interests that you have a passion for. And that's what Angela Duckworth is talking about. We got to connect the passion to the perseverance. We have to find meaning in what we're doing or we will not continue on. People ask me, what's the difference between self-control and grit or perseverance? What's the difference? Self-control is, you know, let's say that I need to do my taxes. I have a choice. I can watch a new Netflix series or I can sit down and do my taxes. I have a choice between A and B and self-control is I choose A to do my taxes. Now grit, it's not really grit because I don't think I have a passion to do my taxes. Grit is about setting those goals and finding an entrance and a pursuit that you love, that you have a passion for, and you're going to do whatever it takes to either achieve that goal, reach that end timeline, you're not going to give up. Number five, I love this one. Cultivate deliberate practice and focus on the action steps needed to complete a project, achieve a goal or master a skill. Deliberate, that's the word, intentional. I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to follow my goals today. I've got to have a plan that I commit to. I have to have deliberate practice. I set aside 30 minutes to work on this particular goal. I have a timeline. It's deliberate. It's not, well, if I have time, I'll get to this. No. Deliberate practice and focus. I love all of Malcolm Gladwell's books. Some of you are outliers, you know, that's all about the success principle. And he says in his book that in order to become a prodigy, to become an expert in anything, you have to commit 20 hours a week to it, at least over a 10 year period, that it takes time to do this. And I love that. You know, and that's about having deliberate practice and focusing and having action steps. You know, Bill Gates was interviewed and uh, someone said, you know, what has made you so successful? And he said, one word, focus. I focus. I focus my day. I focus my minutes. 
I focus my weeks, I focus my months, I focus my years. I have a goal and I stay focused on it. And number six, surround yourself with grit builders. Listen to the success stories of others. Okay, so now here's what you're gonna do. Think about this, you can write it on your paper. Angela Duckworth says in developing grit, we can start which is called the hard uh, thing rule. Let me find it here because I want you to do this for me. Okay, so right now you're going to put in the chat room, you're going to choose one hard thing that you would like to learn how to do or pursue a sport, now something you're passionate about, a goal, a play, a skill, a difficult class. It can be something as you have a passion and you want to, you know, clean out the clutter in your upstairs bedroom. Then you're gonna map out action steps. You're not gonna have time to do that now, but you can't quit until the hard thing is completed. I want you right now to think about what is one hard thing that I can pursue in my life and be committed to it and do what it takes to finish that project or goal or class or achievement. And I want you to post in the chat room. This is about making real what I'm talking about. We can all go hear presenters till we're blue in the face. But what works for us is when we take what presenters talk about and we make it real in our own lives. So think about what is one hard thing that you would like to do in your life, pursue, a skill, it can be anything, you know, it can be run a marathon, I don't know. And I'm gonna stop this share for now. And I want you, ooh, Rosalea, playing the guitar, I love it. Getting my dream home for my family. Yes, skydiving, I love skydiving, I love it. Keep going, keep going. You're doing great. One hard thing that you want to do in your life. I want saving 100,000, I love it, keep going. Keep going. Think of one hard thing that I wanted to commit to having grit. Inner bodybuilding competition, mastering math, learning how to play the piano, buying my first car on my own, playing chess, buying my parents a house, doing art stuff, getting my dream car. Oh, I love it. Keep going. Keep going. This is about one hard thing I want to do in my life. Becoming a teacher. Yes, I'm loving this. Keep going. Keep going. You're doing great. Writing my uh, side dissertation. Yes. Living in my dream home. Yes. Learning to cook. Having the career. Buying my first house. Becoming a social worker and helping kids. Buying an apartment. Becoming a professor. I love this. Professors out there. That's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Keep going. Doing a YouTube channel. Yes. Becoming a pharmacist. Y'all, I'm loving this. Keep going. Go students, <laughs> Dr. B. Go students. Keep going. Becoming a nurse. Yes. Yes, keep going. This is wonderful. And see, we're going to keep this chat to hold you to it. The best being the best mom ever. Yes, publishing a book. Yes. Oh, I'm loving this. Doing a podcast. Saving for a house and pursuing my career. Designing a tropical backyard. Oh, my gosh. These are giving me ideas. Come on, keep going. You guys, raising my children to have grit. Yes. <laughs> yes work out five days a week yes you can do this yes yes get out of debt love that one yes these are hard things yes keep I mean you guys are you're just doing wonderful I'm loving it wonderful 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 yes tilling my whole house yes Yes, keep going, keep going. One hard thing rule, yes, yes. This is wonderful, yes, keep going, love it. Okay, so I, I wanna share with you um, and my last story on grit uh, because it um, has made more of a difference 
in my life than anything. And it's the one reason that I do grit presentations. And, um, and it's about my mom who passed away um, three years ago. And I want to share her story about education. And because I've never known a person who has demonstrated so thank you so much grit. When she was growing up, she lived in a small West Texas town and she was one of 16 brothers and sisters, same parents. Uh, she was number 10 of the rank in children. They were so poor that, and my grandfather was the town drunk and he many times was found in a ditch. He did not work. Uh, he required all of his children to drop out of school by seventh grade so that they could work in the cotton fields. And he, um, he drank, that's what he did for a living. So they were so poor that they lived um, in a two bedroom house and they, <laughs> they had put, you know, my mom and her, six of them would sleep in a bed kind of sideways in front and, there, um, my grandfather did not want books in the house. He really did not want anybody to pursue an education, but they did hang up newspapers on where there were holes in the walls during the cold season. And they had some cold winters in West Texas. And my mother at a young age learned to read from deciphering the words on the newspaper that were hanging on the walls. And when she got into school, she could only go to school three days a week because she had to share one dress with her sisters. And so they had to take turns going to school. And she loved school so much because it was a safe place for her. And she loved the feel of books. And sometimes she would stay after just to read a book. And her name was Addie. And her teachers, when she got to seventh grade, her teacher said, Addie, we know how your father wants everyone to drop out in your family. Everybody knew about her family. And said, we think you could graduate from high school. We want you to stay in school. Can we help you? And she goes, oh, no, my, my grand, my grand, I mean, my, my dad won't let me stay in school. And they said, can we talk to your mom? She said, oh, no. You know, and there was a shame around the alcoholism in her family and around her dad. And one day she went home and she asked her papa, you know, can I please, can I please stay in school? My teachers told me that they, they think I'm bright and that I'm a good reader. Can I please? He said, no, don't ask me again. Well, her older brothers talked to her papa and convinced him to let her stay in school as long as she worked a double shift on the weekends on Saturday and Sunday to make up for during the week. So Addie was able to stay in school and she loved school with all of her heart. And she told her teachers that someday she wanted to be a teacher like them. And they nurtured her. And when she was a junior, her English teacher said, Addie, I think you could go to college. She goes, oh no, my papa would never let me go to college. And she said, well, we have talked to some of the other teachers. We'll help you fill out a college application. And the pastor of the First Baptist Church here knows your story. And he said that there might be a couple of donors that could help you, you know, go to school. And she said, oh. She cried and cried and she went home and she told her papa that it wouldn't cost a penny if she could just go to college. And that day when she asked him, he was so angry at her that he knocked her off the front porch at high porches and she got a large bruise all the way down her arm. And he said, don't ever ask me again, Addie, about going to college. She was devastated. A couple of teachers went to meet with her mom and her mom talked to Papa and said, I want Addie to be able to go to college. And so Papa told Addie, if you go to college, you can never come home again. You're gone forever. That's your choice. 
And that summer she struggled struggled and struggled as she was working in the cotton fields, but she had a dream. She wanted to go to college and become a teacher. And so she packed her, she got accepted into a university and that donor paid for her first year, but she had to work two jobs. And she took a little bus to her university, her freshman year. She had one dress in her little suitcase and she loved it. She loved school. During the summer, she stayed with one of her older brothers. She was determined. And her second year, one of the donors, because of circumstances, could not support her anymore. And she picked up her third job while studying. She worked at an elevator in a local hotel. And as she worked the shift from 11 to three, and she would come home and sleep till six and then work in the mess hall at six. And it got to be so hard for her that one day she packed her little suitcase and she told her roommate that she was going to hitchhike back home and work in the cotton fields and try to raise enough money to come back to university, but she couldn't do it anymore. She was very discouraged. So she set out to hitchhike home and thank goodness her roommate called the track coach, Mr. Coach Lamar, and she told Coach Lamar, about Addie and he said, where would she be? And he told her she would probably be near the Leatherland Highway. He got in his old truck and he went and he, he found Addie and he rolled down, he wrote, got out, rolled down the, both windows, he got out, he came around and he said, come here, Addie Little, her name was Addie Little. He said, do you wanna finish college? She said, yes, sir. And he said, okay we're going to find a way. We're going to apply for more loans. I'm going to help you. I'm going to work with the financial department, but you have to promise me that you're going to make good grades and you're going to graduate. She said, yes, sir. My mother graduated as valedictorian of her college class, graduated with honors. And her parents did not come to her college graduation, but her, some of her brothers and sisters did. My mother went on to teach in California, in Southern California, and she taught in the worst areas of LA and the barrios of LA with some of the most impoverished kids. And she loved every single day. And she became teacher of the year for Southern, for California. She taught fifth grade and she taught all of us. There were four kids in my family that education was the most important thing that no matter what, that we had to get an education to follow our dreams and that we had to be passionate. And I'm grateful because she is the one that demonstrated grit for me. She is the one that carried the message that nothing should stop me from following my dreams. And that I can, not I can't, but I can. And as you follow your dreams, hang around those people who encourage you, who know you can do it, who believe in you. That is the only way to get through and to get to the other side. So what I'm gonna do now is this last thing. Let's, let's see, I think I'm gonna, no, I, I wanna show you my contact information. Um, I have written a book, took a lot of grit to finish it. <laughs> it's called Thrive and it's um, called uh, Channel Your Courage, Speak Your Truth and Shine in the Midst of Life's Challenges. And I talk about grit in this book. You can order it from my website, you can order it in Amazon, but it's cheaper on my website. So I just wanted to put a plug by that. You can, I love Twitter tweets, tweet me at Bully Expert One. I would love, love to hear from you. All right, let me stop share. So you're closing. I think that you're, um, oh, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful comments. Thank you. I think Heather has uh, an evaluation that she wants for you to 
complete. And um, if you also, well, they can do that in the evaluation. And I, I really want to thank you for asking me to come. I, I love working with you. I can't see you, but I, I just want you to know that I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in your dreams. And I think the things you wrote in this chat that you can accomplish. I really believe that. And I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for coming to this presentation because that means that you're interested in grit and you want grit in your own life. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. And um, thank you all the professors that are here. You're uh, Dr. Bean, you're so wonderful. Um, and so Heather, it's you. Yes. So um, as usual with our programs, when you close out of Zoom, um, a survey is going to pop up. If you guys would fill that out for me, I would really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, and let us know what you think. And, uh, you know, we, of course, use all that information to plan more events and everything. And Donna, I that was amazing. Thank you so much for the stories yes. you shared with us. I love the butterfly one. Mm -hmm. um, we actually used to raise butterflies at the um, children's department I used to work at, at the public library. Um, we had a butterfly garden out in the, uh, the, the patio. And <clears throat> the whole idea of the, butter, the, the uh, caterpillar having to struggle, having to build up those muscles, having to do, you know, it, it, it's important. It, you know, you got to spend some time in your chrysalis before you can emerge and fly. That's so exciting. you got to go through the struggle. Yep. Struggle. yep. Yep. Yeah. So, but yes, hopefully, maybe in the future, Donna, we can see about having you in person and then you can see everyone's smiling faces and everything. That would be amazing. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yes. More interactive when I'm in person. I'm just not talking so much. So I would love Yes. That. Yes, I'm I'm looking forward to doing more in person stuff, hopefully in the future. But you know, I'm I'm just so glad you were able to do this with us now because this is excellent. And, you know, I'm sure a lot, we have a lot of uh, very inspired students right now. So all of you, you know, you can go out there, you can do it. I know you can. STC students are amazing. So I can't wait. I want to see your, see the college too. I mean, yes, yes, definitely. I'll, we'll, we'll take you for a, for a whole tour. Um, if we can get you down here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please thank the student. I mean, I want to thank the students for doing the chat, for just stepping in and sharing, being vulnerable, taking risk. That's what it's about. Yes. Know. Thank you for spending your Wednesday evening with us. Yeah. Yes. Loved it. So. Yeah. All right. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, again, fill out that Zoom, uh, that survey uh, once the Zoom closes. If you accidentally closed it, don't worry, you'll get an email um, <laughs> in a day or so bugging you to do it. Um, I am nothing if not persistent. Um, uh, true. <laughs> so, so yeah, and I'm looking forward to, to more, uh, more activities in the in the future and hopefully I will see you guys again soon and thank you again Donna um, you. and yes. give your kitty cat a pet for for me <laughs> uh, <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> for charm and chiming in yes so. yes <laughs> all right thank you so. thank you you were such a wonderful host thank you thank you so much bye everyone bye everyone thank you for for being here we appreciate you <laughs>